Thank you for tuning into um, today's session, Athletes, Ableism and Advocacy, Centering Disability Identities, Disability Rights and Disability Justice. We have a great group of panelists today. I'm so excited to introduce them to you. Um, but first, I'm just gonna take you through a couple of um, quick items to kick off uh, the session. Um, I wanna thank the Bob Woodruff Foundation for um, their longstanding commitment and support. Um, they were really key in helping us to deliver the 2021 Move United Education Conference this week. Uh, my name is Julianne Mills and I am a program manager at Move United. Um, I'm here today at my home office in Maryland um, with a virtual background that features um, Move United's logo in our conference room. Um, and I have long brown hair. I'm wearing a black Move United polo shirt. Um, and I am going to take you through a couple of um, quick items on Zoom here, which I'm sure you're all pros at at this point. Um, if you would like to view this at a later date, it is being recorded and will be posted on our learning management system. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, we also have live uh, closed captioning during the session that you can enable using the button at the bottom of your screen. Um, as well with the chat function, just make sure to set that to send to all panelists and attendees. Um, you can go ahead and introduce yourself there and where you're coming in from. And um, what I'd like to say, I think most importantly, to ensure that this is an engaging interactive session is to make use of that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. Um, anything pops up in your mind during the session, feel free to jot it down there. Um, our panelists are really eager to um, share information with you and help address any questions that you have on this topic. So um, don't be shy, make sure to drop your questions in there. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to the moderator for our panel today. Um, Karen, take it away. Thank you so much. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you're Zooming in from. I wanna say thank you to Julianne, Kayla and Jess for being in our space today with Move United and also thank you to Move United uh, generally uh, for giving us the opportunity to be here with you today. So. My name is Karen Korb. I'm a disabled, white, wheelchair-using woman with a multicolored, uh, long blonde hair, really needs a haircut, absolutely. I'm wearing a striped blouse with a navy blue scarf around my neck. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm zooming in as an uninvited guest of the Muncie Lenape land, and uh, also known as New Jersey and I sit in deep reverence and gratitude to, for, and with them. I will be your moderator today. And what I trust to be an informative discussion that centers, and I'm gonna repeat this, that centers the expertise of disabled people, which in our industry of adapted sport, para sport, unified sport, and especially academia is often not the case as it is usually led by white non-disabled men and women. I also wanna add that while uh, it is listed that I work for Lakeshore Foundation in policy and advocacy, I resigned from the organization approximately four weeks ago. Uh, I think they have shared my personal email. So if you have any questions about that, uh, you can either send me an email or wait for the TED talk. Uh, we are now in a very significant time of change. And often the disability centered narrative simply doesn't make the cut. Why do you think that is? Discomfort, perhaps, ableism, the pervasive addiction to the charity model, maybe? Or could it be the resistance to experiencing people or athletes with disabilities as powerful, educated leaders who mandate parity, equity, and inclusion, and who will also no longer accept the mediocrity of well-meaning individuals who believe they know what is best for us. And when I say us, I mean disabled people. While some of our conversation today may create some discomfort, I can feel it already, we invite you to think about why that may be for you and encourage you to share your thoughts in the chat um, and your questions later on, trusting that we'll have enough time to get to them. 
It is my absolute privilege to be joined by our esteemed panel in a provocative educational discussion, highlighting disability justice, disability rights, ableism, internalized ableism, disability representation, and hopefully we'll get to our advocacy recommendations. Not only are these panelists my colleagues, but they are incredibly dear friends. I welcome you all. Thank you for being here and the gift of your attention. Um, I invite our panelists. Let's start with uh, Ileana. Let's let you introduce yourself and uh, tell the audience a couple of details about you. Hello, Karim. It's great to be here with you. It's great to be here with all these wonderful panelists. I'm joining you guys from Houston, Texas. Uh, this is where I live today, although this accent is not from Texas. I am uh, born in Cuba and I have lived in the United States for the past 50, uh, 20 years actually already. Um, I'm talking to you from my home office. <laughs> um, I have some nice picture frames behind me and I'm, I'm a brown hair girl, a very Latin looking girl <laughs> and with a great shirt and I'm happy to join all of you guys today and speak a little bit about this subject as it's such an important topic for all of us. I am a Paralympic athlete. I retired from swimming. I swam for Team USA in London 2012 and my real job today is as, a, as an architect and designer as I work uh, in topics of inclusion and accessibility. I think Ileana is also being very modest. She's the chef de mission to the refugee team um, and so many other accolades. And we welcome you, Ileana. Thank you for being I don't here. Want to, I don't want to bore people, you know. <laughs> you are an absolute goddess, let me tell you. Fierce in every kind of way. Uh, next up, Keith Jones. Hello, thank you all for having me. Thank you, Kim, for the invitation. Uh, my name is Keith Jones. I am an African-American male rocking a red shirt against a neutral background. I too am in New Jersey, held up in my former COVID bubble. Um, I'm an activist slash owner of Soul Touching Experiences, a wannabe athlete back in the day up until I discovered all the wrong things about life and enjoyed them, um, but as well as an activist in the policy walk regarding inclusion and education from voting access all the way down to employment. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for being here. Keith, is, uh, you, you are so my person. I just adore you. Thank you for being here. And next up, the infamous Candace Cable. <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you, Karen. Thank you for inviting me and Move United and, and to be part of this panel with everyone. You know, first I, I have to start off with just Karen Korb is a truth to power speaker and someone who's taken seriously that community accountability and building equity systems that care for and create opportunity for each of us as we seek, seek our collective liberation has been just a mentor, a friend and so many things to me. And I am so honored to be a part of this with you, Karen and the other people on this panel. Um, I'm zooming in from the occupied traditional lands of the Tomba Nation. It's also known as Los Angeles. I am in downtown Los Angeles. My pronouns are she and her. Uh, for those that don't see me, I am a white skinned woman with brown and silver shoulder length hair. I'm wearing black rim glasses and a black turtleneck. I'm sitting in my wheelchair and behind me is a wall with art and the books Disability Visibility by Alice Wong and Skin, Tooth, and Bone, a Disability Justice Primer from Sins Invalid, and More Than Organs by Kay Unlin Day Barrett. You should all have these in your library. <laughs> Let me just start there with that. Uh, I had a spinal cord injury at the age of 21 in 1975. I think I'm probably the oldest person on this panel. I have a very, very long background in uh, Paralympic sport. I was in nine Paralympic games, both summer and winter, 12 time medalist in sports, three time Olympic demonstration competitor. I was in 84, in over 100 marathons and won 84 of them, six Boston marathons. I'm the first woman to win medals in summer and winter games, as well as doing it in the same year in 1992. And I am not going to be humble here. I'm just going to tell you that. I'm telling you this because it's important to know that all of us here 
have done quite a bit and we've worked really hard in a lot of areas. And that's one of the reasons why we know advocacy and activism is critical to be able to achieve our goals. I work um, in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I say advocacy, uh, access with that because inclusion is not access. Um, it's in compliance to the law is not access. My platform really from sport gave me the opportunity to really open up a lot of doors and then create some heart-based education materials and trainings on how to understand the disability experience and then become an ally in the fight for our collective liberation. Um, some of the work that I've done is with the Christopher Reeve Foundation for about eight years, doing uh, writing and webinar series, 10 years with the Open Doors organization in travel and tourism industries, creating equity. I'm an expert in the Air Carriers Access Act. I've worked with UNICEF on inclusive education, the State Department Speaker Specialist Program, the LA 28 bid team to bring the games to Los Angeles. First time Paralympic Games is gonna be there. And um, I participate regularly in the United Nations Convention on Rights for Persons with Disability and the Sustainable Development Goals. I volunteer my time and I did eight years from 2012 to 2021 on the Athlete Advisory Council for the USOPC. And let me just say this, um, if you don't know it, there is inequitable representation for Paralympic athletes on the Athlete Advisory Council. The Olympians have one athlete for every sport. And Paralympians, I think we have 13 athletes, maybe a little more. I'm gonna have to run that by Jess for over 30 sports. Um, this is part of the problem. This is why we need you to advocate. I volunteer with the US International Council on Disabilities, the Southern California Paralympians and Olympians Association, the Mayor's Office Commission on Disability, and as a racing coach for the Angel City Sports. So I'm super happy to be here. <laughs> And you know what? I, I really believe that's the abridged version. I really <laughs> think it's a short version. So welcome, welcome, welcome everybody. And uh, this is great. We've got so many people on, on, this, on this webinar. Oh my gosh. So why don't we start with you, Candice? So often those within our sport, and you, you mentioned it in your intro, um, they don't realize, or, or, nor do they appreciate, um, admin and athletes alike, the historic work that has been done by advocates that have literally fought for and created a right to exist in life outside of the walls of the institutions. And a lot of people don't know that, um, as well as the mega opportunities um, that we currently have to participate in sport. They didn't just come overnight. Uh, can you give us some context around the disability rights movement and also the Convention on the Rights in the International Scope, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And why is it important for those within our industry to understand our powerful history as a core competency? Thank you, Karen. So I teach a pretty deep dive into the history of people with disabilities in the world when I teach my understanding disability education. And what I wanna to tell to our audience here is you're gonna hear some things that are uncomfortable. Uh, I've been told that people get upset when I say you must do or you have to, uh, because people don't like to be told what to do. And I'm asking you to please get over it now because these are things you must do. You must take up these banners because disabled people who have been doing it are exhausted. And we need everyone on board for this. So I'm asking you to please have an open mind and heart while you listen to us. If you feel triggered at all by any of this, take a deep breath, take a really deep breath. Do the four squared breathing. Uh, it helps, it really works. And don't let your fragility overtake you because you have to do this work, becoming an advocate and an activist and creating advocacy for your students and your athletes is critical. You have to educate yourselves on what the issues are and where we have been. And the oppression, the lack of equity and governance in sport for disabled people, you have to dismantle your own bias too. 
only teaching or administering sport doesn't serve your constituents. And you're here because of those constituents. You wouldn't be here without disabled people. So you don't know what you don't know. And it's better, um, it's just better to relax and take it in and start to begin to dismantle some of these. You know, as a white person, I've had to, I've had to have my own reckoning with my participation in white supremacy and privilege and my own racism and dismantle it. And I had to educate myself about my black and brown siblings experience because of enslavement and racism and be an ally in dismantling the systemic institutional racism we have in this country. This is about our collective liberation. And you too, all of you in, involved with sport, adaptive sport on any level need to do those things too now. So this is really about building allies and knowledge and alleviate some of the pressure that's on us disabled people because we are we are faced with micro and macro aggressions constantly. I, you know, I use a wheelchair. So people will say, oh yeah, we're accessible. We only have two steps. Okay. Or wow, I don't know how you do it. I would kill myself if that happened to me. These are things that many of us who have visible disabilities hear on a daily basis. And this kind of stuff, as I said before, is exhausting. And we need more people with disabilities as well as non-disabled people working in areas to dismantle this systemic ableism. So in the history, let's just go, let's just go all the way back to time recorded by humans. Disabled people have been either destroyed or institutionalized. And we didn't start coming out until the mid 20th century, around 1950, 1960. Before that, we were, and we still are, considered of no value in most places. In 1980, my first Paralympic Games was supposed to be in Moscow because at the time they were starting to think about Olympic and Paralympic Games in the same city and venues. The Soviets said they didn't have any disabled people at that time. You can think that in, right? If you, if you saw Rising Phoenix, uh, you would have heard that story there. And uh, we have Keith Jones on here, who is one of the performers and uh, co-creators of the theme song for that, that movie. And if you haven't seen it, go see it. I believe it's on Netflix. And it'll give you a pretty good background of that kind of situation that we're faced with. But before this time, and even now, we, we've had zero value. Our biggest value is inspiration porn for most people. Uh, and, and I heard a, a great story recently um, from one of our disability rights leaders, Imani, that Karen was telling, and I hope that she'll tell it again about Nike and some shoes. But it's important to remember that over and over, we're fighting for physical access. And really, the models that Karen was talking about, charity, well, we also want to mention the models of the medical model, because in this country and worldwide, there's an institutional bias to institutionalize people with disabilities. And it continues on. Even in this pandemic, we saw that happen when the 1135 waivers were brought forward, and that medical bias said that anybody who was deemed not particularly valuable or that their life maybe wasn't um, as healthy, which is a term that has a subjective meaning, wasn't healthy enough, they could be taken out of the hospital and put in an institution to try to recover from COVID. And we know that the majority of the deaths of people were in the institutions. So, the laws that we have in this country and some of the international stuff to to move this a little bit quicker is in the united states we had a civil rights law in the early 1960s that came about disabled people were left out of that so in the 70s there was the rehabilitation act that came forward which said that anything that was federally funded needed to be made accessible but they didn't write the regulations for it and it sat it sat for four years and in that sitting disabled people all over this country were getting angrier and angrier that the regulations were written so that the law could be enforced because it couldn't be enforced without it 
and they were throwing their bodies in front of buses and taking jackhammers to the corners of streets so that they could create a curb cut to be able to get up and down because transportation wasn't accessible, schools weren't accessible. If you had a disability at that time, going to school was probably not something that was going to happen for you unless you could actually walk around. I have a friend who uses a wheelchair full time, but in his early days when he was a child, he walked on braces and the school made him walk all over the school on his braces to prove that he could do it, even though he was gonna to go to school in a wheelchair. And this was in the, the early 70s. Well, by 1977, people with disabilities have had it and they started to take over federal buildings all over the country. And all of them failed except for the one in San Francisco, which to this day is still the longest takeover of a federal building ever. 24 days they were in that building. And the reason they could stay there was because they were supported. And if you saw Crip Camp, and if you haven't seen it, you need to go see it, another Netflix flick. <laughs> you see that we had a community outside of the disability community that supported us. Black Panthers supported us. The religious services supported us. The machinist union supported us. That sit-in that lasted those 24 days finally resulted in getting the regulations written, which was the beginning then of the next phase, which would have been the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990. So from 1979 to 1990, people were fighting to be able to get access, just access and civil rights, because we were still weren't part of a civil rights piece ever anywhere. And even the human rights document, first one written in 1948, we weren't part of that either. Our first human rights document didn't come until early 2000s that I'll tell you about with the CRPD. But I wanna let you know something about the Air Carriers Access Act. The Air Carriers Access Act came into fruition in 1989, a year before the ADA. They saw the writing on the wall. And so they got the Access Act together. And the reason the Access Act is written in a way that a person like myself who has been wronged by the airlines cannot sue the airlines. I cannot sue the airlines. The airlines can be sued by the Department of Transportation, but I cannot sue the airlines. I cannot create litigation against them. They wrote it that way purposefully, so they wouldn't be accountable. That's something we see throughout. Hey, Candace, I think that's um, I think that's really a really important piece to yeah. our history. Um, often people think that you know we're just out there litigating all over the place. And that is not the case. You know, when, when you think about um, the history of disability rights and disability justice, we, we have been asking and demanding things for a very, very, very long time. And when yeah. you have been put at the end of the line every single time, and that is still current time. Now, if you are prioritizing something, whether it's, you know, if you, if you are a person without a disability and you are asking for something, and it doesn't come your way, you usually get upset about it, and usually it will happen for you, right? Well, in the case of disabled people, that is, that is not what happens. That is not what happens. And going back to what you talked about um, with the, the ventilator rationing, that is still happening current time. If it yes. was me and my sister, my sister who does not have a disability, and I both getting COVID in the hospital, they would gauge my disability and say, she has no quality of life. And it's legislated that the vent is given to my sister who they believe has a quality of life because she, because she does not have a disability. So you think about those numbers, but I digress. I want to go to Keith real quick because um, just in terms of time, um, Keith, let yeah. me get my question for you. I'm going to throw some resources in the chat for all of you as well. Because Keith, can you share with our audience why, and why, especially now in 2021, the principles of disability justice, and I'm going to put those resources in the chat, um, must be centered as the framework of all of our work in sport, in our industry, in advocacy, moving forward. Yeah, and I, you know, I wrote my notes. Yeah, unpack that in five minutes. Okay, <laughs> Good right. Good okay, All right, let me take a deep breath. Okay, uh, well, there's two things. So the thing about disability justice 
and every movement that we've had related to disability has essentially been about the rest of humanity taking their heads out of their butts and understanding that we literally are human and we have the varying human conditions. So when we talk about disability justice, we talk about the fullness of our humanity, being able to access healthcare, being able to access housing, education, being able to go on vacation, being able to get on an airplane, being able to get on the bus, being able to be in school, everything that Candace spoke about, I've experienced. Uh, being one of the first kids into a school where you were the only kid with a disability, never mind the only kid with color. So why do we need to center it? If you cannot see my humanity, if you only focus on what my quote limitations are, then you're not doing the job. What is the point of Move United if we are not talking about the humanity of the, the individual who's, a, who's, a, who's an athlete? You know, there's, there's something that happens before you're even able to get to be a wheelchair user who is in a marathon or a basketball player or, or a swimmer. You, you need to be able to get out of your house. You need to be able to get onto the sidewalk. You need to be able to get to the transportation. There are steps before you even become an athlete. And so when we stand back and say, we're not really here for disability justice. It's all disability justice. It's all about humanity. It's all about the rights of individuals to express themselves. The irony is, is that people find themselves saying, I didn't know that it was so difficult. Yes, you did. Yes, the hell you did. And if you didn't, then you were not paying attention to what you're saying. There's a difference between being at a, a barbecue and hanging with your friends. Oh, I didn't know that. But showing up in spaces intentionally and being unaware of bias or being unaware of barriers, those things have been around for time and memoriam. It's, it's an old adage where people go, you're so amazing. I don't know how you do it. Well, I do it because that's what the hell I do. And it's, but it's a standard where they say, but for the grace of God, there go I. Because humans have the inability to conceive themselves in your situation. Hence why men are misogynistic. Oh, you women can't do those things because they cannot conceive of it. If you talk about racism, any kind of ism or phobia is the lack of intelligence or weaponizing your ignorance in order to maintain a certain status quo. But in terms of justice, particularly disability justice, it really is just saying, please, it's not even a please. It's if you claim to be intelligent and understand what this is about, then we are all allowed to live our life as best as we can fit without people intentionally setting barriers to prevent that. So if you're making a program with that, I was unaware that it wasn't wheelchair accessible. Uh, well, you know, we're in 2021. There's no more excuses now. There's no more rationale for not being aware of differences or the fact that human identity is self-defined. So if I, if I define myself as a person of color, what happens to have cerebral palsy? That does not give you the right to then arbitrarily place limitations upon my abilities to exceed or to meet my dreams. That's where, when people talk about what is justice, what is justice? Justice is just being able to wake up and exist without somebody projecting their own negative stereotypes upon your humanity. And in those places, hopefully we will get to that place. I mean, we're coming out of a pandemic and people have managed to become, I'll keep that word to myself, they've become a little less intelligent in terms of how they see the fullness of our humanity. So again, justice is about being able to just exist within the society and have the same access to opportunity, liberty, life, love, success, failure, dreams, hopes, bad decisions, bad hangovers, good, bad pictures on the internet, 
and be able to live your life without having to worry about somebody saying, oh, you know, those people in wheelchairs really don't know what they're doing. So hopefully at the end of this discussion, people will not just say, well, we have the ramp or we have the ASL interpreter or we have CART, but we really see the fullness of your humanity. And what we will do is design a program in order for all of that to come, come to fruition. Exactly. Keith, you know, yeah. a couple of weeks ago, we were having this chat and I wrote down the quote um, from you and we were just having this conversation and, and you were like, why would I want to be in a place where my humanity is seen as a cultural curse? And I thought that was incredibly profound because so often we as disabled people, that is what you experience in public spaces. And the denial of that is your own internalized ableism. So with that, uh, Ileana, tell us, let me get to my notes right here. I mean, okay, how have you benefited from the disability rights and disability justice movements in your athletic and professional careers. And I'm sure we could talk about this for days because you are highly accomplished and incredibly humble. Please. Uh, thank you. Yes, I think this is a great question. And for me in particular, it means a lot because I was not born in the United States. So I grew up in a country I was not born in a wheelchair either. And I was in a country where I was a ballet dancer. So it was celebrated, of course, the fact that I was so able to do so many things. Uh, when I stopped walking, I started to be worthless, you know, in a way of, uh, in, in the sense of like, well, you cannot do this anymore, or you cannot go this place. You cannot do that. You cannot, I remember showing up to a party once and one of my friends from ballet asking me why I was doing what I was doing there and I look at her like I hope I'm doing the same thing as you are as long as you're not doing something too strange um, so this for me when I came to the United States I realized that my first encounter was in high school uh, that I realized that through sports I was being welcomed by my team in the school which was not a team for people with disabilities or anything it was just a regular swim team in the school where the coach heard that i knew how to swim and this guy basically asked me if i wanted to join the team and i was the one who told him no i cannot do it because i do not walk because i was coming from that reality of that reality of people telling you and not having any type of rights if we believe that we're behind in the u.s I welcome all of you to take a plane anywhere else, anywhere else. I'm not talking about Cuba. I'm talking about anywhere else. And, um, and I think for me, that encounter with that teacher was mind blowing because I realized that I was in a place where people with disabilities, even though we have a long way to go, had a door, <laughs> at least one door. <laughs> and this door was wide open and you could do something with it. And from that point on, I realized that I could do whatever I wanted and it depended a lot on my attitude more than anything else. And there was gonna be people out there working with people with disabilities, assuming a lot of times what you could and you couldn't do. And people who did never work with people with disabilities who would never stop you from doing something. This coach never worked with somebody in the team who had a disability. And regardless of that, he had the education and he had the skills to say, you know what, this woman is just a person who knows how to swim. He didn't care about anything else. And the wonderful thing about it is that I actually ended up being a varsity member of the team, which at the time I didn't even know what that meant. Um, and it was because I was able to bring the points that the team required to have the 500 meter done to check that box. So the first place of anything else that we, whatever we want could actually gain those points because you needed someone that would finish the 500. It didn't matter if you ended first or you ended last. So this guy found a little niche where I was like a crucial person in that team. And that made me feel like I was actually part of it regardless of any disability. 
And of course, I became clever and I started looking for people who were extremely slow and I could beat them and stuff uh, <laughs> in other strokes because we're all competitive. And that was a fun part of it. But I think we have to understand, and at least for my experience, is that we have, as Candice was explaining, a wonderful history in terms of people who have been out there, who have been working so hard for what we have today. And we cannot let that go. And the way to not let it go is not to stay comfortable and believe that a ramp is enough, that believe that because you're welcome to a place is enough. No, you need to show up. You need to show up and you need to act the way that you feel in terms of being a person as equal as somebody else that who doesn't have a disability. And whether this person still wants to make you feel the opposite, try to work it out and make sure that you give yourself the right value. And I think this is very important, and this is at the stage that we are today, that we cannot keep on sitting back and rely on just regulations. We need to be pushing even further for rights, for people to be able to show up to a yoga class. And the yoga class is not for disabled people. It's a yoga class, period. I show up, you know what to do. You explain to the teacher, the teacher doesn't have to be an expert, but you explain to the teacher and this person needs to be open to welcome you in. And I think this is where we, we are at this moment. And I think that we can do a great job if more people are educated. And the only way to educate is from the people with disabilities to begin with them and go all the way to everybody else. This should be in every single class in the United States in the world of architecture it should be in every single school of architecture i think we cannot rely just on a book and a code and a check mark to say that something is uh, is accessible and of course i have benefited from it and all, all of us i think have benefited from that code and from, from that uh regulation that law that protects all of us but i think that there's still more to cover for sure and i think we're all all of us are key players on this Oh, Ileana, my sibling. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Um, I absolutely, I think you touched on some really important points because so many of the people in our audience, they're running programs, they're heading up programs. We need your allyship and we need your educated allyship, which is so much of what we're talking about in the equity space. You know, what is the terminology that, that is relevant in 2021 to move our population forward? You are not empowering us. We are co-powering each other. It's a reciprocal relationship because often the power dynamic is, is here. We're going to tell you what to do. And what is happening now is this. And there's quite a bit of resistance to that. There is mutually exclusive expertise here. And again, people who are running programs specifically in the disability space for often forget that you have a job because of disabled people and it's not the other way around so that being said let's talk a little bit about what we talk about in advocacy there's a lot of discussion about ableism and internalized ableism and we're at 11:40, so i am rushing right now i'm going to throw some some information in the chat um and i would love to start with candace candace um, now, ableism is, is, there's short definitions to ableism and there's longer definitions to ableism. Um, I'll let Candace handle that, but I'm gonna throw this in the chat for you. But I, I would love for each of you to give some examples, some working examples on, on how you have experienced ableism in your life from others, how it's projected onto you, as well as addressing and being accountable for your own internalized ableism as a means of survival in spaces that were not built for us. Thank you, Karen, this yeah. is Candace. And um, you know, I wanna start with, there's 7 billion people in the world and we have 1.2 billion people that have disclosed they have a disability. I use disclosed because of our internalized ableism. People who have non-visible disabilities often won't disclose they have one for fear of oppression, discrimination, stigma, bias, and that is a hindrance in a major way in being able to create equity for all of us throughout. You know, the short version of uh, ableism is um, some bodies have more value than other bodies. And 
And, uh, and the long version, the long version is really, I think, and I know Karen's going to put it in the, um, put it in the chat, but um, T. Lewis is, um, is someone who is an activist and one of our leaders in, in the disability rights movement. And what they write is, ableism is a system that places value on people's bodies and minds based on a societal construct, ideas of normality, intelligence, excellence, desirability, and productivity. These construct ideas are deeply rooted in anti-Blackness, eugenics, misogyny, canolial, canol <laughs> colonialism, thank you, imperialism and capitalism. This form of systemic oppression leads to people and society determining who is valuable and worthy based on a person's language, appearance, religion, and or ability to satisfactorily reproduce, excel, and behave. You do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. And so with that sinking in and reflecting on it, and I hope all of our whole audience looks at it and starts to reflect because it, it will begin to grow on you. I, I wanna reflect on my own internalized ableism in this, in this space because as an athlete, it's a little bit of the nature of the beast is that we have a tendency as athletes to have a very deep intrinsic internalized ableism because it, the whole thing is about making it happen, overcoming something, you know, having all these options and then doing whatever we need to make it happen. And that does work in sport to a certain degree. But after we leave sport, we have a tendency, especially as disabled people, to live in a world that wasn't built for us. You know, we just came out in the mid 20th century and doesn't include us and also wants to resist us. I mean, with the Americans with Disabilities Act, it's either education to get results or litigation. And oftentimes litigation brings resentment, anger, and, um, and just people only wanting to do what is compliant and compliant isn't access. And so as disabled people were like, oh, I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll make it happen. I'll, I'll get that done. And we'll put up with things that don't suit our needs. And we're not able to get what we need and to be able to progress forward. And so we then have this internalized ableism and I have my own that I've been dismantling for years that we have to get rid of because in doing that, we, we open it up for everyone. And uh, on a, a couple of the things I wanna say about this is, is that please remember that the essence of ableism comes from racism. And it's our duty to dismantle racism because it's my, my feeling, my perspective that once we are able to dismantle racism, the other isms are gonna follow. They're just gonna follow. It's just gonna happen. And we, we need allies. We need allies in this space to really begin to look at their own internalized ableism, whether you have a disability or not, and how you play that out and then begin to dismantle that. Thank you so much, Candace. Uh, Keith, comments. All right, so ableism is, the irony is, is when you add a gender ethnicity um, to a disability, it's, it's, it, it becomes a, a cabal, a big mishmash. So depending on where you are, you have to pick and choose. Like, did they just do some racist, or was it ableist, sexist, phobic? Like, you start picking out um, <laughs> which one it is. I think. Uh, okay, so I'll deal with the internal ableism. The internal ableism for myself wasn't so much that I wasn't proud about what I, you know, who I am, because I, you know, my birth my disability was from birth. So I have no before and after. So it has always been. And so for the challenge working in disability is for those who will come to disability is, is working with people as a, as a counselor was like, your life is not over. Um, you know, but then you're running up against people going, 
you know, you were you were a rock star, and all of a sudden you're sitting in the chair. And so the the distinction of eye level, eye contact, or handshakes or hugs, all of these things that are normal, quote unquote, take on a different kind of uh, a different kind of meaning once you enter the world of disability. Although I think we're the coolest place to be, that's just my own personal opinion. The internal ableism comes from the fact that you are constantly trying to disprove a negative. So you're constantly trying to say, I can, I can, I can, even against a world that says you can't, you can't, you can't. And particularly here in the United States, what and you know, and when I talked about it being cultural, if you're in an agri you know, there are cultures that if you're born with a disability, they set you on the side of the road and you die. There are other places that don't, there are languages that don't have terminologies for disabilities. If you come from Haiti and you have a cognitive disability, they say you're sick in the head using Creole. So it's never really a, it's never an internal thing. Like it's sort of like body dysmorphic disorder or you know, women having to meet a certain beauty standard in certain cultures, this is what society expects of you. But if you are sitting in a wheelchair, you're using crutches or you have a mental health challenge, you have these things, um, how do you meet that standard that society says is normal or perfect when you clearly are not in that standard? Um, the, internal, the internalized ableism that I faced uh, is, is really wasn't even about me, it was about other people. It was like, well, I'm glad I'm not as disabled as his ass. I'm glad I'm not crippled because you understood not so much that you didn't like that person or that you didn't understand what their issues were, but you knew that in the aggregate, you were going to be compared fairly or not. In, in, in the black community, it's unspoken. If there's three of us in the room and there's a bunch of white folks and one black dude that crazy, Oh Lord Jesus, he's gonna make us all look bad. And so it because we understand that the larger societal ripple effect is that it will have a negative connotation for the rest of us. So the ableism part is not for the most most of the time I see it, even within the disability community. Uh, working in the independent living movement, it was white spinal cord injured men and then everybody else. And if you had a mental health challenge, Nobody even wanted to talk to you. Or if you're deaf, if you're late and deaf, no, I'm not deaf. I'm big be deaf, so I'm real deaf. No, I'm little be deaf. Well, you're not really deaf. Like we do that to ourselves. And that's not, that's because we understand that if we allow somebody to slide into that space, there could be a negative repercussion. So how do you deal with that? One of the things you just came back and say, well, what is the point of ableism? What is, the point, what is the point of sexism? What is the point of homophobia? What is the point of xenophobia? It's not to it's not to embrace the fullness of someone's humanity. It is to arbitrarily select the characteristic of someone's human condition in order to set them apart so that they can be less than in order to elevate yourself. That's really what this is. And so when you stand back and say, am I ableist? It really is. How can I not be as jacked up as the person behind me so I can look better? The old adage is if you're two people running from a lion, you know, I don't have to be as fast as the lion, I just have to be fast as you. And so that's the scenario. So when you stand back again, and, it's, and, and if we're talking about we're looking for allyship, allyship, I shouldn't have to beg you to want to support my humanity. People, people, people tend to bifurcate their allegiance and their concern and their, and their issues based on what is comfortable. So in this scenario, for sports, for athletes, particularly athletes with disabilities, and particularly any organization who deal with those, is to understand it's not just about sport. It's not even just about race. It's about you need to be able to see the fullness of my humanity and elevate that entirely versus picking and choosing selective aspects of my humanity that you're comfortable with in order for you to be cool. Because there's a lot of there's a lot of people I don't like. 
But I'm not going to sit here and be like, well, just because you don't know how to cook collard greens, you can't hang with me. No, but if I approve, but if I love you and I want better for myself, I have to want better for you. So that's sort of how, you know, ableism has a weird kind of way of showing itself in strange places. You know, even in the autism community, the cerebral palsy community, the Down syndrome, pick a community, we will self-stratify in, in order for us not to be low man on totem pole. <laughs> Yeah, it, you know, it speaks to a lot of things that we're currently working through, um, whether it's classification or the hierarchy of disability. I don't want to be deaf, deaf people don't want to be blind, blind people don't want to be amputees, amputees don't want to be bilateral amputees, single leg, and the list goes on and on and on. And we all know that, those of us who are athletes specifically know that intrinsically. And so what does that mean to us? And how, do, how are we, how are we introspective within that conversation? And how do we broaden the narrative of inclusion, checking ourselves, right? So for the sake of time, uh, Ileana, I'm going to go into a bit of a language piece. Uh, a topic that is continuously at the forefront is the language we use. Not only how we reference ourselves, disabled, this person with a disability, some other form of ably, pasticky, specially abledness, euphemism, something, something, but also how we allow the media to represent us within the industry. <clears throat> While we recognize that language is fluid and everyone identifies in the way they feel is best, um, help us understand why it is important to claim your identity, whether it's I am a woman or I am a disabled person. And how does that fit? into the scheme of athletics? Well, I'm gonna, I'm not an expert on the subject. I wanted to put it out there. Uh, but for sure, I think uh, after this many years, I have a, an opinion of my own <laughs> that I, will, I would love to share. But I think I, I, in terms of language, as you, as you said, definitely is something how, is our freedom to decide how we want to be defined. Right, so I think I think we we have to depart from that point, and also I think how others perceive us a lot of times is based on that as well, because you are the person that puts yourself out there and defines yourself out there. And in terms of the media, in terms of the media, needs tremendous amount of education on how they express themselves about disability because they still have that language of ableism in the way that they talk about people with disabilities. They usually, when they're in sports, it's amazing at how slowly, I think it has progressed a little, but there's a long way to go how, when they start to talk about people with disabilities, they focus on the disability rather than their sports accomplishments. Even though you are like an amazing athlete, and now I have been facing this lately. I, I was at a meet and I was supporting this athlete who, and I had to like really come to the, to the person that was going to interview him and say, listen, we're, we're talking about his abilities and his amazing sports skills. We're not talking about today about, you know, how he lost an arm or how he lost a leg. This is a conversation about sports. And if you're not comfortable with that conversation and bringing him to that level, then maybe you're not the right person to interview him. But you need to understand that this is what we're talking about. His stories is amazing, but because of he has a bad story, that's not what makes him a great athlete. You know, and this is the type of messages that we need to, that we need to keep on sending out there. In terms of the language, we have to, of course, be extremely careful, but also as we portray ourselves as well, to be able to encourage a good language as well. Yeah, and this is something that both, I think that there is a, um, I don't know, in my, in my personal experience working with people with disabilities and working with people without disabilities, which is a constant in my life, in terms of uh, design and, and architecture, you would be impressed on how this happens at that level as well, on how people communicate about it it's that they're doing you a favor in a way 
oh, they're bringing you into the space and this is the right thing to do because we're kind people. No, you're not kind people. You need to do it because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do for many, 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 many reasons and we can be here all day naming them. But it is important to understand that the person who is defending the other side, to give it a name, must be very clever and must be very well educated to make sure that this gap that you were talking about, you know, is, is constantly bringing up to that same level, even though, you know, it's an uncomfortable situation, but it needs to happen. We cannot keep on letting people just telling us what to do or how to do it. Thank you so much. That is, a, uh, isn't this a great panel? I love mm -hmm. you guys. Oh my gosh. So I want to, we've got about 15 minutes. Um, if you want to throw some questions in the chat, we can uh, take a look at those. I want to very quickly go over, um, there were two very, very large components that I don't think we're going to have time for, but briefly, you know, yesterday I was listening to a session and uh, the presenter, while it was a powerful presentation, they used the word overcome a lot. They were talking about the Tokyo games and they were talking about, um, well, we're set, athletes are gonna be fine because Paralympic athletes are used to overcoming. And I thought to myself, I said, you know, if y'all all recognize that we're so good at overcoming, why is the unemployment rate currently at 12.6%, right? And, and, and why must we, must we fight for all of our resources? And like Ileana said, it's the right thing to do. Why, why are these things not happening? So what we say matters. And I want to, um, I'm going to put two resources in the chat. One is from our, uh, an amazing athlete and an, ama an even more amazing professional, um, Dr. Anjali Forber-Pratt. She co-authored a research piece um, on this subject entitled hashtag say the word a disability culture commentary on the erasure of disability while i do not have the link for that because it's a pay for a journal article if you are friends with dr anjali for pratt please reach out to her um but if not you're gonna have to pay for the article at any rate and then there's a great language article that um is on the lakeshore site i'm going to put those in there before i forget so you can check that out when time permits. And uh, yeah, so uh, let's see. Let's look in the chat questions. Uh, what are some suggested act what are some suggested action steps you can give for people, I'm guessing there's a who, who want to be an ally in disability justice movement? To the panel. Who wants to start? Oh, that's low. Oh, I'll start. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, actually, I mean, I guess the, the first question, the first answer is to be an ally. That's number one. And, and to be an ally, to be an effective ally is to one, be aware of your own bias. That's number one. First, be aware of your own bias. Secondly, understand that in order to be an ally, you have to, you have to, deal with the, the unpleasantness of the issue. I think a lot of people, particularly coming out of, in America with the Black Lives Matter, everybody wants to wear a t-shirt and say Black Lives Matter, but nobody wants to talk about the fact that we need to end qualified immunity or that we need to do structural, structural uh, re rethinking the way we fund schools, public education, how we do all of these things and the underpinning of vagrancy laws. So when you talk about how to be an ally, the allyship is really just acknowledging that wherever you are in the world, whatever the quote dominant culture is, unquote, is that there's a reason that it's a dominant culture. And there's a reason that you are not, it's not an inclusive culture. So you have to one, be willing to give up your comfort. Because, and that's the hard part about being a real ally is mm -hmm. am I willing to give up my space in order to join your fight? in order for you to share in the space that I currently occupy. So that, that's probably the easiest and the shortest answer I can give. And this is Candace, and, and I would add to that is um, listening to the disabled person as to what the need is and paying attention 
to what it is. And don't overlay what you learn from one disabled person onto another because we're not a monolith. <laughs> we're, we're all very different. We have different needs. But get ready to speak up in those places when it's needed to speak up. Uh, I was in front of an elevator with a non-disabled friend once and we were talking away and the elevator opened and it was filled with people. Now we were one level up. We only had to go down one level, it's one staircase. He looked at me and he looked at them and he said, why don't you all get out of the elevator so that we can use it? And they all stood there stunned, the elevator closed. And I thought that is the kind of ally I want. They see the problem, they speak up and they don't leave it on top of me to do it. Because because that's the ship that we need. We need we need that. The work that we as disabled people do and living our lives is exhausting because we're constantly having to navigate and monitor and pay attention to all these pieces that a non-disabled person wouldn't have to. And, and then I would say on the idea of the right thing, it's really the only thing to do. It really is. I mean, let's get over this morality piece, this right thing. Is, and I love it's that the right thing and people really love it, but it, it's the only thing. It's the way we're gonna make this happen where we have a collective liberation. Yes, Candace, I mean, it is the only way. Uh, so appreciate, so appreciate that. So there's another question here. Um, Question is, why do you think that disability is not getting nearly the attention that race and LGBTQ, I will add IA plus, is getting in this recent DEI movement? Mm. Woo, we could talk for days <laughs> about that. I'm just gonna do a really short one because we scare yeah. the shit out of people. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't know what to do with us. They're like, oh my God, we used to lock these people away and now they're all over the place. What do we do with them? Oh, who, what do I say? How do I say it? Oh my God, I'm just not gonna look. I'm just not gonna look. And then people will say, oh, I don't see your disability. It's like, if you don't see my disability, then you don't see there's a huge problem out here that I'm dealing with. And it's not just physical access. As Ileana said so well, it's about attitude too. It's about dismantling those attitudes. And, and Keith said about your own personal bias. Um, yeah, I, I just think that's the reason, one of the reasons why we're not a part of DEI, and I like to say A, access, because people are afraid of us because they see their reflection of themselves in us, and they don't realize that disability is a human life experience. We're all going to have, baby. We are all going to have it. So get on board. Let's get this thing rolling. Um, and I think there's a lot of other reasons I'll let everybody else talk, but that's my favorite. Oh, another, you know, and that, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Eliana. No, no, if I may add to what Candice was saying, I think we're very afraid of getting old, I guess, because, <laughs> because there is no way back. I, I, uh, I always, and I think it's funny because if you think of a kid and the needs of a kid, is not that far either from the needs of a person with a disability. Uh, so at some point in our lives, we are all confronting some sort of a disability and we're just denying it. <laughs> and I think that that's the biggest issue. And for the for these other groups, I think it's great that the, the exposure and what's out there. But I think these groups should look at people with disability as part of their groups as well. Yeah, I, I, uh, this, this is everywhere. It's not, it's not something that you can just hide under your pillow, you know, <laughs> it's everywhere. It, it, yeah, and Elia, you know what makes me, I, I think what makes me so um, aggravated, I'll say, is that every, every group who is fighting a social justice fight manages to leave disability behind. Every just every social justice fight. It doesn't matter where you're on the planet. Mm -hmm. Every social justice fight negates disability, and that is a historical and a cultural piece. I think one of the reasons you haven't seen it um, in this explosion of people trying to be like, we're doing diversity and equity and inclusion, hooray! Right? Is because they because in a capitalistic system, 
your body is not being able to be monetized, right? If you're talking about the unemployment rate, you're talking about access to capital, you're talking about invention. And the irony is, is that the people who claim to be the brightest seem to be the dumbest. So if you can't, if you can't manage to talk about social justice, I've been at rallies and they've come up, Black Lives Matter, oh, but you can't come because, well, you know, you're disabled. Like, no, nah, I'm black too, right? Like, like that don't go away. If I'm talking about women's reproductive rights and you should happen to show up on crutches, no, you're still a woman too. So the challenge is not us having to enlighten people. The challenge is for people to say, if we are in these fights, who are we not seeing at the table with us? Who's not mm -hmm. here with us? Who's not, if you're talking about migrant issues, if you're talking about shit, it doesn't matter what you're talking about. We are 20% of the global population minimum. And that's every culture, every country, every human being on the planet. If you are not smart enough to do social justice and be fully inclusive, sit your ass down and start somewhere else. But that's just my own little personal I'm back. I had a moment. <laughs> so here's another, that's great. Um, uh, so there's a question from Katie Smith. Thank you. I think this is a great question um, for the panel. Uh, I work with, she says, I'm guessing she, I don't know your pronouns. So I work with youth and young adults with disabilities. What are your suggestions in instilling the need for them to become advocates and leaders? I think, you know, here's my quick suggestion before I go to the other panelists is weave it into the program. If you're just playing wheelchair basketball or tennis and, and you have no concepts of the history of your sport or the fact where your transportation even came from or, or the medical model or any of the models of disability and inclusion, well, then we are doing an incredibly deep disservice. It's not just fun and games. Sports is the catalyst for change and is a platform for change. And then when you educate in a way that makes learning about advocacy fun. So I challenge all of you, all the programmers out there to expand your programming, to include advocacy, to include the language of empowerment and co-powerment, mm -hmm. to prioritize this information, you know, and you can weave it into plain because I will tell you, if you are a non-disabled person, that is a nuance of disability. You may not prioritize that because you want to see your kids having fun, right? Because you believe that this is the space that, ooh, they're just going to, you know, we want them to play because they can't play anywhere else, right? It is our duty and responsibility to impart this wisdom to them so that when they leave sport, they graduate from school, if that is their choice and that's what they want to do, that they have the skills to navigate this world that was not built with us in mind. Yeah, please. This is Candace and um, yeah, well said. And I would add to that uh, is that teach them about civil engagement and governance and how our systems work. Too many disabled people don't know how to get stuff done. They just don't. They're like ADA, ADA, ADA. And that is not, that's not the answer. In fact, that that one is, is probably the most difficult to, to put out there. And weave the stories in to the programming. Talk about, you know, you're getting on an accessible bus with a lift. Talk about the people in the 70s that didn't have that and what they had to fight for and where it came from. And then give them the resources to research it themselves. Educate yourself. Educate yourself on all these things and talk to other disabled people, all different kinds, not ones just like you, but all different kinds to find out stories so that you can share them. And there's some really wonderful books out there. There's all kinds of resources that, that can be used, but continue to weave it in because it'll teach them how to self-advocate first, advocate for themselves, and then be able to look at a bigger picture of how to advocate for everybody at, and, and that is really what we want because we want, you know, our democracy is about participation. 
And that's what we have to do is be able to participate. And for too long, disabled people haven't been able to participate on multiple levels. Uh, if I can add to that one, I'm gonna give you one challenge. We always speak about how we want to be included, but what about if you start to include in your programs people without disabilities that can come, where the people with disabilities will be the ones teaching them, would be the ones giving them a lesson, giving them a life, a life lesson, and also you would have people leading within, the, within that group who are people with disabilities. And I think that that's gonna empower them and it's going to kind of flip that coin back and forth of the reality of me being part of your group and you being part of mine. And I think this is very important if you really want to accomplish inclusion. I would absolutely agree with that. There are a ton of questions in chat right now. Um, okay, let's grab, we've got, oh my goodness. Okay, like two minutes. Uh, ooh, that's a big one, the person first language. I think, I know it's an anonymous attendee. If you wanted to share uh, your email with us privately, you can reach out to the panel privately. We can answer that, um, that question uh, later uh, via email or a conversation, however you want. Uh, Oh, this is a good one too. Do you feel that the disability movement appropriately respects intersectionality? Well, there is an entire session on that for oh. our dear friends and colleagues. <laughs> uh, Stephanie, yeah. Steph, and uh, Patty Cisneros, they're up, mm -hmm. I think, I believe after us. Um, so I would, I would encourage you all to um, go to their, uh, their, their session. And yeah, as, a, as an answer to the question, I mean, Keith said it, no. We do not. Mm -hmm. No. We do not. We like, do not. The, like I said in the beginning of this conversation, you know, historically, disability rights was predominantly white disabled men, period. And we are working very hard to move the needle on that. Um, but if you cannot be accountable, then we can't transcend what you don't recognize. Keith. Yeah, I, I, I just want to, if I, I'll just leave you with this. Um, intersectionality, just like affirmative action, just like the hijacking of those things become handles that people use and lose meaning. Mm -hmm. If you are doing a social justice movement, if you're doing any kind of movement, if, particularly if you're talking about disability, there is no definitive ethnic cutoff. Like, oh, you black, so you can't be disabled or your First Nation, you're not disabled. That doesn't exist. If you are a person who is intelligent, who is trying to do good work for society, that means you need to be fully inclusive and understand that humanity runs the entire spectrum and gamut of identity and, and gender and, dis and ability. That stops it. And when you reach out to the community, if they only look like you, then you suck at what you're doing. <laughs> if, like, like this is not complicated. If we are trying to elevate our society, then we understand what makes up a society. And that is all forms of humanity across all bridges, all ethnicities, all languages. So intersectionality is a cute buzzword, but if you're doing the work, it's about the humanity. Yeah. Okay. So we are, y'all know we could talk for days about this and hopefully we will have another opportunity to share uh, this excellence with you all. Um, Julianne, thank you, you, your entire team, um, the staff at Move United for this incredible platform to share our wisdom um, and receive this information from the amazing participants. Uh, thank you so very much. Yeah, the, the feeling is mutual. Um, so glad to have you all join us today. The chat has really been blowing up. Um, I know we couldn't get to all of the questions today, but this has definitely demonstrated to us that we need to have a follow-up to this. I think, I think this is just the beginning of the conversation. Um, this has been a great way to hear from you all, um, you know, be able to confront the ignorance that exists, fuel conversations, and most importantly, incite action around this. Um, so we really appreciate you being here to share all this with our community. And um, I want to encourage everyone in the audience as well, if you 
learned anything in today's session or something stood out to you, um, keep the conversation going on social media, share the recording with um, people in your network and, and help get this information out there. We appreciate that. Um, and with that, I am going to um, close out. We're out of time here. So thank you again and uh, enjoy the rest of your, your day. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care.